Okay. All right. So tonight, does everybody have tonight's lesson? No? Okay. Well, tonight's lesson, it's called the King of the North. I'll ask my lovely assistant to pass those out. He is your lovely assistant. Okay. <laughs> He's my assistant. I <laughs> should Okay. All right. So, um, and I, I asked my wife to pass those quiz, quiz cards out. And I just recall, there's no quiz because we're skipping lessons. And so, um, <clears throat> So we won't do a quiz tonight. Okay. Oh, good. Okay, I do have a special gift for everybody. And I'm going to ask my lovely assistants to pass these out. Can you, can you handle some more? Okay. This is my new book, yes. I changed my name to Mark Finley. So that's, that's my pseudonym. Yes. I don't know him, but I know who he is. Why don't we start off with a word of prayer and then we'll get to your, your question, Harold. All right. Or your comment. Yes. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for bring, bringing us here tonight. We pray for your Holy Spirit's guidance and teaching today and your word tonight. And we, um, we thank you ahead of time for your blessings. So be with us in a special way tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, Harold, you had a question. Well, I, I don't know if it's appropriate, but uh, David Gates was on last year, about a year ago, and he said that the Bible is making all kinds of... Right, predictions. We don't get into, really, we shouldn't. But anyway, so then Mark Finley reacted to that. Right, mm-hmm. This is the lesson. Yeah. Where he was getting his information is the last. Yeah, so there was a, uh, you're right, we won't go into it, but uh, David Gates is an individual who made some predictions based on sort of a dream that he had, and he consulted with a friend of his or friends about this dream, um, predictions about what would happen last year, which nothing happened. This was back in 2019. He, he, he made these predictions in 2018 in October, if I'm not mistaken, around the fall, that something would take place in the spring of 2019. As far as we know, um, now I have to be honest, I didn't keep up with the news to see if his predictions came to pass, but I didn't hear anything. Um, but even before those, the supposed fulfillment of the prediction, Mark Finley did come out with the video and he was refuting this individual's prediction. So that's what it's about. Okay, we are going to talk about health. So I'm gonna invite my wife to come on up here, and she wants to talk. We need that. Yes, right here. Oh, yes. Let me get you a microphone. Testing. Testing one, two. Okay. Okay. 
in the oven and roast them, and then you can make an awesome soup with okay. all mix all of There this. you go. You're ready. Okay. So, um, the stay in the, nuggets, Stay there you? because of the filming. Oh, the health nugget, nugget for tonight. Uh, it, uh, oops, wrong way, wrong way. Okay, it's about herbs. Okay, maybe you know who can name these herbs that we have here. Let's start from right to left. What do we have on the right? Rosemary. Rosemary. And then next? Onion. No, next is uh, sage, blue sage. From and right to left? From right to left. From right, oops. Around. Yeah, from there to here. Around. Around. It's rosemary, blue sage, lavender. What? Mm. No. Looks like some kind of mint, right? Okay, the next one, the flowers. Arnica. You know what's arnica? Oh, it's great. Yes, yeah, it's great when you bruise, when you have bruises, when yeah. you have a cough, when you have a cold. It's good to start taking it in October when, it, when you start seeing the signs everywhere that says uh, free flu shot. Okay, start taking Arnica. It's better than the flu shot. Yes. Okay, and the last one? Yes. Very good. Yes. Have you used those herbs in food, right? They're good. They're healthy. But also you can use them as a tea. You can make tea of those. Uh, just don't boil them. Boil just the water and then you put the herbs. In a lot of those, they have different pro pro properties. properties. Yes. And they help a lot to be calm too. Like the elderly, I work with the elderly a lot. And when they have the sun down and they get anxious in the afternoon, uh, well, when it starts getting dark, it's good to take a sage tea for them. So they can keep them, the, the, the sun downers, to keep them calm without giving them uh, a lot of drugs. And it's better for all of us. We know that our body is the temple of God and we have to take care, right? So the less drugs that we take, it's better. I, and I have to say this before. I am not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I learned this as I read, but please consult your doctor for any change. Okay. Let's go to this. We have what here? Chamomile. Chamomile. That is well known for a lot of abilities to reduce the nausea and indigestion, but also it helps to calm. Right? When we need to sleep better, when we are anxious, when we are sad, when we have all those emotions in our body, chamomile helps a lot. Not only to that, but it also helps a lot to the respiratory system. And we have mint here. Who doesn't have mint at home? We have all kinds of mint. I see now at the store like Thai mint and uh, who knows, a different kind of mint. But they all smell good. I invite you to try it as a tea or water. Now that the summer is coming, mint, mint and, and, and cucumbers, they go well. So you put them in a jar, pieces of, uh, 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 cucumbers and some mint and that will help a lot to relax also. It helps to relax and helps the mind when you are too tired and you're coming from work or being a volunteer or have a stressful day. It's good to take some of these teas. Now we have here something for headaches, lavender. If you have it at home, try it. It's good for headaches or any tension that we have. The lavender is very easy to grow in pots or in the garden. And when they are full of flowers, uh, you can put the flowers on your pillowcase. It smells good mm -hmm. and that will help you to relax and smell good, right? Yeah, we use the essential we oil. Use, we use the oil, but uh, we put a little drops too, but it's good to, to sleep well. Um, I was going to say about the chamomile. Um, oh, chamomile. Uh, I mean, the lavender. Only the, even if you make like lemonade, you can try it at home. Lemonade in the summer, when you already make a lemonade, wash those flowers really, really good and put the flowers there. Your lemonade will turn into that color and it smells really good and it will calm you. The lemon and lavender, they are body 
Nice. So it will help a lot to relax. So when you have a very tiring day, I invite you to take a tea or a lemonade with, with lavender. The next one, this one is linden. We don't have this linden here. Uh, the difference between this one and the other one that I just mentioned, the other herbs, they grow small or like this big. But linden is a tree, okay? We do not have that tree here in Arizona, but you can find that linden, uh, the herb, uh, in little packages, big packages, whatever you want to in any herb store. I've never seen it on um, Walmart, but also you can order those in by... And the flowers? That yes, the flowers, yes. It's very good tea. Have you tried one of these teas before? Nobody? This will help you a lot. It helps to relax a lot when you're tired or when you have a lot of things in your mind, when you travel a lot, when you've been having a very hard day. Try this before you try piling on or any other drugs. And we have here a catnip. Look at catnip. It's this excitement in cat in cat, but has the opposite effect on humans, okay? Wow. They put them active the cat, but to the human, calm. Okay? Have very good uh, properties to reduce excitement and palpitation. Consult your doctor. Okay? Palpitations, people that they have, so it's good to have this excellent calm you when you are really exhausted. And this one, you can see them at um, Home Depot, passion flower. Right now, they have a lot on Home Depot. They're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful flowers. I like them, they go fast. But also, you can see that this passion flower, you can make a tea, and it helps when somebody has anxiety, reduce the stress and headaches. So the Lord has provided a lot of herbs and a lot of plants that we need to learn how to use them and how to use them. And if you're taking any medication, just to ask the doctor. Most of the time, these these plants they don't they don't have other side effects. But the people that are diabetic, please talk to your doctor first before you introduce any kind of herbs. Okay? Because if you take oregano tea. It's very good. It helps a lot for the system. That the oregano that we use to season the, the our our food, but it's not good for people that they have uh, heart problems. And there's other herbs that are not good for people with diabetes. So anyway, I talk to your, to your doctor. Keep in mind all these plants, and let's use the uh, all these beautiful greens that the Lord has put us into our reach. And in here, we can find them anywhere, right? Even though if they don't grow here in Arizona, we still can order them in Amazon or online, and you can have them. I also understand when you're using the word tea about caffeine, do any of these? No, right. no. Right. And remember, you don't boil, never, you never boil these herbs, okay? When you're going to make a tea, you boil the water, and then you put the herbs and turn up the stove, cover it, and that's the tea. When you boil the plants or any herb, then it's not tea. And I don't know how to say it in English, but it's like... Steep. Steep it. Focus. Yes. Focus. How do you say it? Focus. Focus, yes. Yes, and it's totally different side effects, okay? Totally different than a tea. And the, when you boil the herbs, when you boil any of those plants, the water that you use there, it's good to use it in your face or where you where you have a bruise, where you have a cut, where you, different uses when you boil the plant. But you boil the water and put the herbs, turn up the stove, and that's the tea. It's very different. Do you have a list of combinations? No. No, I don't have that. And I thought one time to do it, but it's very hard to um, 
because they're, they don't go with a lot of medications. You know, it's like grapefruit. If you boil the, the skin of the grapefruit, it's good to lower the cholesterol, but it's not good for people with diabetes. That the medication that they're taking is not good. Or if you're taking medication for your cholesterol, it's not good to take the boiled skin of the grapefruit because it doesn't go well. So you have to consult your doctor for that. Well, in any a lot of medications, you cannot take them anyway with grapefruit, right? You know that. Yes. Huh? It's not good for arthritis either. Grapefruit? Mm. Okay. Okay, I guess we're done. So I invite you to go to uh, the store and get some of these plants and try them. And when you fall, you cut yourself, try them too. Smash them, put them on I your skin, that. and they're all good for you. Thank you. God is good. He has yes, provided yes. all this for us. Right? We have to give the glory to God. That's right. Yes. Just click it off. Thank you, Mrs. Navarro. That was excellent. Is she a good speaker? Yes. Okay, so we're going to do a review. Actually, yes, we're going to do a review. Um, and it's going to be repetitious, but there's a reason why. All right, so in chapter 2 of Daniel, of course, uh, we see Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And, of course, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has the dream, and then Daniel interprets it for him. And then there's the, uh, the vision. Head of gold, let's test your knowledge. What are the arms and chest of silver? Oh, do I have it on? It's on. Maybe it's just not high enough. See, I have competition with two mics here. So I've got this one. And then I have this one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I can talk like this. It could be the battery. Okay, and uh, the arms and the chest, that is Medo-Persia, and then you have the belly and thighs of brass or bronze and the legs of iron. Rome, yes, and then what about the feet? Yep, the feet of iron and clay, they don't mix, there's no mixture in there, you can't really combine them two, and they, it, you can combine them, but they won't mix. And that is uh, the divided kingdoms or nations after Rome fell or when Rome was. You know, Rome actually declined little by little. So most scholars give the year 476 AD. But even before that, you know, that was the last emperor. Even before that, it was just, it was declining. Um, but for the most part, for, you, most uh, use 476. And then, of course, the stone that became that mountain. Uh, and filled the whole earth. That was the kingdom of Christ. Um, in our world today, when they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay, that's our world today. There's just divided nations. Um, I wouldn't take the unification of Germany as a sign that, oh, okay, you see, this prophecy failed. You know, back in, when did Germany unite? Was that back in like uh, 90, 91 or... In 80, no, because communism didn't fall until 89. The Berlin Wall came down in 89, so I know it wasn't in 87. So it must have been in 80, uh, 90 or 91 when East and West Germany came together. Or the European Union, you know, and Europe just, you know, now you don't have Czechoslovakia anymore since years ago. Now it's, you know, Czech, Czechia or Czech Republic. And, I mean, just Europe changed, but you still have a lot of divisions in Europe. England just left the European Union, what, uh, a month ago or, or something? They've been talking about it, and so who knows what's going to happen with the, with the EU. Chapter 7, Daniel's vision of the beast. He received dreams and visions. He saw these four animals that you see on the screen representing the kingdoms of the world. The lion represents Babylon. The bear represents Medo-Persia. We're doing a review. The leopard represents the kingdom of Greece. And then that big, ugly, dragon-like, T-Rex, monstrous, T -Rex. Oh, whatever, whatever it was, uh, represented pagan Rome. And then the little horn uh, that came out of Rome, the Roman Empire, is Papal Rome. Um, 
you know, it just, this just requires a lot of reading instead of just a little simple lesson like the one we're doing here. If you want to, uh, one of these days, look into how um, civil, political, you know, pagan Rome eventually metamorphosed into more of a religious and how close the two are related, you're going to have to do some reading, but it is, it's fascinating to read. I'm not an expert on this. I haven't read everything. I don't know if anybody else has read everything out there, but it's really interesting how some of the terms and some of the structures were just slowly came into uh, the papal Rome. Question? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. So there's 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 a lot of connection there, and then of course then you have a judgment in Daniel chapter seven, uh, a judgment in heaven that takes place at the time or after this little horn power, after this little horn power. And then you come to chapter 8, the ram and the goat. Remember what the ram represents? Yep, Medo-Persia. Medo and then the goat Greece. represents Greece. That big horn, well, King Alexander, I don't have the big horn here, but then a little horn came up after the big horn fell off and you know there was four horns, the division, and then after the big horn fell off and after the four horns, then came up this little one and that represents Rome as well, civil and religious. Okay, so question why does God continue to give us the same visions and dreams over and over and over? Why does he do that? It must be important. It's exactly right. It must, it's, it must be important. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we tell our kids, do not go near the stove, a little kid this high, don't go near the stove, and we say it over and over again. I took my dogs out walking today. They're learning how to walk. We're, we're, with the three of us, are learning that I am the leader and they're the follower. They're not walking me, I'm walking them. They haven't learned that yet. And so I have to constantly say, hop, hop. Instead of saying no all the time for everything, they just know that inflection in my voice, hop, or stay, stay. You know, they're learning that. They're learning that. Because, oh. <laughs> But, you know, repetition is important because something's important that God wants us to know, right? And so obviously it indicates uh, their importance. Okay, today's lesson is called the King of the North. All right, I want you to look into your lesson. I have a few remarks, but I want to read this first. If you open your lesson, and the top on page two, it says the book of Daniel is very much concerned with the sequence of nations that were to arise from Daniel's day to the what? Time of the end. This is crucial to keep in mind that these prophecies are long-term prophecies. They, they project far into the future. That, that is so important to keep in mind. Um, and they, from Daniel's day to the time of the end. Every prophecy in the book of Daniel intimately describes this panorama of the nations. Seven times already Daniel has gone through this sequence. Twice in Daniel 2, once in the vision, and twice in the interpretation. Um, where am I? Three times in Daniel 7, once in the vision and twice in the interpretation. Uh, Daniel 2 is once in the vision and once in the interpretation. I think I misspoke. And then twice in Daniel 8, once in the vision and once in the interpretation. In chapter 11, Daniel goes through this sequence for the eighth and final time since each succeeding prophecy unveils further details we can expect to discover exciting new information about the end time in Daniel 11. Okay, Daniel 11 has excruciatingly painful detail. <laughs> and it is notoriously difficult to decipher every part of Daniel 11. Um, whether it's, you know, biblical scholars in general, uh, the scholars of our church, um, it's not the easiest chapter to decipher. So we're going to go over a little bit chapter 10 and then chapter 11. Chapter 10 is like a big intro. It's a big introduction. And keep in mind, chapters 10, 11, and 12 are the same vision. It's all the same thing. Okay? 
Um, so there, those three are together. Okay, um, if you look in your lesson, there is something happening in Daniel 10 when Daniel receives the vision. There are some unseen forces at work that are battling each other. And for three weeks, three weeks Daniel is just like out of it. And there, during that same time period, he, it's unbeknownst to him, there's these powers of the principalities of the air that Ephesians 6 calls it. They were battling each other. No wonder why Daniel couldn't get any information or for three weeks, because during those three weeks, uh, the angel Gabriel, assuming the angel Gabriel, couldn't even come down and, uh, and help Daniel. So this is where it starts. Now, if you look at Daniel 10, open up your Bibles, and let's go to Daniel 10. And the first three verses, it opens up in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, by this time, the first group of the Judean exiles had already returned to Palestine. If you were to read Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the uh, uh, decree of King Cyrus, you guys can go back to your country. Anybody wants to go back, you can go back. So by the third year of King Cyrus, there had already been Jews that had uh, returned, except Daniel. Daniel evidently didn't go back. So Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 3 says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but, he, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. He understood it, it says. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is a summary. We usually describe something, and then at the end, we have the summary or the epilogue, or the last word, or something. This is reverse. He's already given you a summary, and then he goes into what had happened uh, when he was, you know, trying to, when the vision was trying to come to him. And then verse 2 says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, so, you know, no brownies, no salmon with garlic and lemon, you know. No good stir fry and no pleasant food. He says, in those days I was more, I had no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks for, were fulfilled. It's kind of like, oh man, you're just, you're not eating hardly anything. You're not washing your face. You're not cleaning your face. You know, uh, he didn't anoint himself. And he's just, for these three full weeks, that's how it opens. So let's look at the first question, uh, the controversy. What does Daniel do for three weeks? We just read it. He's mourning, okay? What is mourning? Well, that's what mourning is, sad. Uh, he's, he's sad, grieving, weeping. He's just down. He's in the pits. Daniel is just in the pits. So even the Daniel... Even this man who is highly esteemed by heaven, highly esteemed is what the, as Daniel says, even the best of them get down, don't they? The best of them phew, are just like, you don't want to get out of bed. Yeah, he, he's human. But to, he's mourning for three full weeks, the Bible says. <clears throat> and then uh, question number two is verses 4 through 10. Let's read those verses. Go back to your Bible. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris. Now, where was Babylon? Which river ran through the city of Babylon? Tigris. It was the Euphrates. Yeah. So apparently Daniel is not in Babylon. He's by the Tigris, by the banks of the Tigris. Some kind of business errand or something. Um, the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and he wasn't alone, by the way. A certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl. That's like a yellowish color, if I remember. His face like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like the torches of fire. His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. And the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, this is obviously a celestial being. 
This is an earth. This isn't an earthly being. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see it, but a great terror fell on them, so they fled and hid themselves. So even though they didn't see the vision, the presence was felt. They something was in the air, something that freaked them out, and they ran and hid themselves. Even Daniel freaked out. He fell on his face. Yeah, much like the guards at the, with the angel at uh, Jesus' tomb. And even Daniel himself. It says here in verse uh, 8, I was left alone. No strength remained in me. My vigor was turned to frailty. I retained no strength. Um, he says here, the sound of his words. The end of verse 9, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. <laughs> so, Daniel was, now, you know, I don't think he fell like, Bam, and he breaks his nose and jaw, but I think it was just weekend, and he just, I mean, had no strength. His knees were shaking, and he fell on the ground, and, and he was just, and then somebody taps him on the shoulder. Somebody touches him and says, Daniel, man, uh, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. And so it says, uh, I stood trembling. That's verse 11. He stood trembling. Okay, so the question says, who appeared to Daniel at the end of the three weeks? We just read it. A certain man clothed in linen with this gold belt, and barrel, and gold of euphaz, and um, eyes of like torches, feet like burnished bronze. You know, Jesus has very similar descriptions in Revelation chapter 1. Yeah, very similar descriptions. Okay, number three, why didn't help come to Daniel immediately when he started to pray? Now, this is interesting because look at verse um, 12 and 13. Verse 12 says, Don't fear from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. Your, God. your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So he's coming in answer to Daniel's prayer, but he says this, verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for how long? 21 days, the three weeks that Daniel was mourning. Um, wow. I'm reading, I'm going backwards here. Let me, um, okay, so let's continue reading. Uh, but verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. This is what the celestial being is telling Daniel. Okay. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people when? In the when. The latter days. This is post Daniel life. Daniel's life. Way post Daniel's life. In the latter days. For the vision refers to what? Many days yet to come. This in, in apocalyptic prophecy. Uh, remember I said, uh, this was last night. Apocalyptic prophecy has certain characteristics as opposed to classical prophecy. Classical prophecy. If I were a prophet, I'd say, hey, you guys got to pray more. You got to read your Bible more. Uh, come to church and fellowship. You know, don't abandon the gathering of yourselves together like some are accustomed to doing. Hebrews, you know, what it says in Hebrews. Um, you know, and, and I'm saying, and you know, when you go to work, be honest and be nice to people. Remember the golden rule. That's classical prophecy. I'm giving you instructions on how to live right. And if you don't, uh, clean up your act. If we don't clean up our act, um, God's going to come in and just punish us. He's going to take our church away. That's classical prophecy. Apocalyptic prophecy is I say, oh, I was in vision and I saw these symbols and this vision pertains to way in the future. Starts now, but it goes way into the future. Symbols and there's no condition to it. It's going to happen no matter what you do. A long-term prophecy when the future is the day of the Lord. The Bible in the Old and New Testament talks about the day of the Lord. What do you think that refers to? The second coming of Christ. No matter what happens, 
Jesus is coming back. Now, you know, he may, we may have, you know, retarded the progress. You know, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, we can hasten the coming of the Lord. That, to me, is an incredible statement. So apocalyptic prophecy and the things that will happen in the future, they're going to happen. Right here, he's saying, this is not going to happen because it pertains to many days in the future from Daniel's day. So we need to remember that. That this is not talking about what's happening to Daniel and his people during the time that he was in, uh, you know, when the Persians just barely took over. This is in the third year of Cyrus. It's talking about way in the future still. And so the vision that we come, uh, that we're going to get to in chapter 11 is way in the future from Daniel's day. Okay? Keep that in mind. So let's look at this. Um, number three, why didn't, oh, I can't believe the time. Why didn't help come to Daniel immediately when he started to pray? The answer is, from the celestial being, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. I might as well just mention this right now, the prince of the king of Persia. Um, maybe I'll mention, I have my little notes here. Um, I think I'll probably, no, I'm going to mention it later. Okay, number four. Who would be the subject of the rest of the vision, according to Daniel 10, 14? I'm going to read it. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to, what? Your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So this is Daniel's people. Um, in the latter days shall befall thy people in the latter days. Okay? So again, this is the introduction. Um, okay. Um, then let's go to question number five. Daniel fainted at the revelation of what was to happen to God's people, but what did God do to Daniel? Now again, I hope you read the chapter. Okay, and it says here, in Daniel 10, verses 15 through 19, there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, gave me strength. So, uh, obviously, this is just too much for Daniel to handle, <laughs> even if it's just a vision but the content of the vision and what he sees, and the vision is given in detail in chapter 11, the content is just too much for him. It, it's a lot. Now you can see why Jesus told his disciples one day, I, I have many things I want to tell you, but you're not ready for them yet. I'm so thankful that God withholds information about myself, because if he reveals everything about me, it will probably kill me. <laughs> so he's very gentle with us. He's very gentle with us, isn't he? Question number six says, who are the next two powers that will affect the covenant people that God will have to contend with? According to Daniel chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. You read the chapter? The prince of Persia, okay, and the prince of Greece. The prince of Persia, what question was this? Number six, look at your note on the bottom of six. Before Daniel is given the delineation of empires and kings that will affect the covenant people, God reveals to Daniel the cosmic struggle unraveling. He allows Daniel to see that he works against, that God works against Satan's attempts to subvert the divine purpose by contending with the forces of darkness to accomplish God's plans. Again, we are given the divine assurance that God is in control of world history. God is in control of world history. All right. The events of Daniel 11. This is a doozy. I have read, uh, you know, commentaries, and no one commentary agrees 100% with each other. You know, there, you'll, get, you'll get different uh, viewpoints. You'll get, you'll get a lot of agreement, but you'll get different aspects. And you might even find something that is maybe a little bit opposed to each other, but it is, is notoriously difficult. Um, fairly recently, 
um, a certain uh, gentleman is was doing a Daniel seminar specifically focusing on on this chapter, Daniel 11, and referring to Islam. Um, that Islam is portrayed in Daniel chapter 11. I don't even remember the guy's name, but I remember there's there was some um, oh what I want to say advertisement. I think an Adventist Review or some of our, our magazines. And not everybody agrees with that. Not everybody agrees with that. Um, I read one article by an Adventist scholar. Um, I don't know if it's Gerhard Pandel or I don't remember which one it was that uh, says, or Angel Rodriguez, Manuel Rodriguez, that scholar from BRI, um, you know, refuting this idea that Islam is portrayed in Daniel 11. So, um, I am in no way an expert <laughs> on this Daniel 11, because it is, it is very difficult. Like I said, it's, uh, there's a lot of detail. Okay, here's a fact. The king of the north is a symbol of the powers that oppose God's people down through the ages. Remember, this is way in the future, okay, from Daniel's time, but it pertains to his people in the future. It is the term used to refer to those whom Satan has used in his attempt to destroy God's people. This is why, in the beginning tonight, there's a lot of repetition. And it's like God is just drilling it into our brains. Um, there's earthly powers that are against my people, and I'm going to have to contend with these powers. I control their destinies. Um, it's just the same pattern over and over and over again in all of these, in all of these prophecies. Um, but each prophecy gives a little bit more detail. So by this time, in the third year of King Cyrus, when Daniel has his vision by the Tigris River, let's say Daniel was 15 years old when he left Babylon, okay, in Daniel chapter 1. By the time you come to the third year of King Cyrus, you are at 536 B.C., Daniel left Babylon in 605 B.C. You do the math. From 605 B.C. to 536. How many years from 536 to 600? 64 years, right? 64 years plus another five years to 605. How many is that? 69. Add another 15 years. 84. 84 years old. So Daniel is possibly older than all of us here. <laughs> he's 84 years old. So he's, and, and still, after all these years walking with God and being a faithful man, you would think, Daniel, that you could take these visions. Hello, take it like a man. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's right. No, I don't think so. He was he was mourning. Yeah, that's right. I like to think Daniel was still physically strong uh, because believe it or not, faithfulness to God and living a moral life adds to physical strength. That's a thing that a lot of people, uh, you know, in this world don't understand. Living a moral life. Eating well, of course, but living a moral life, being faithful to God, it adds to physical strength and energy and vigor, just overall vigor. That's what it does. Okay, um, number seven. With what empire does Daniel 11 begin? Let's look at it. Chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now, I, this is still the celestial being speaking, and now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in where? In Persia. And the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of what? Greece. Now, I haven't had read the whole book, but I'm sure Herodotus speaks about this in his book, The Histories. You know, he was, he was a, the, the father of history, they call him, born in 480 B.C. And he's talking about the Persian-Greek Wars. Interesting reading. <laughs> Interesting reading. I've read some of it. Um, okay, so 
uh, stand up yet three kings in Persia. So this vision begins in Persia, but it goes way towards the latter days. Remember, we already read that. Okay. So the, uh, where am I? <laughs> so I always get mixed up here. Uh, no, I'm in the lesson. <laughs> okay. The three kings in Persia. Yes. Yeah. The four kings mentioned in this verse are Cambyses, Smyrdes, Darius, and Xerxes. They are all kings of the Persian realm is what our lesson notes. Why does it say Paul Smyrdes? Um, because he was not the true one. <laughs> Just kidding. Why is he called? <laughs> Why is he called false Smyrdes? I'm not sure about the false uh, Smyrdes. Um, it could be that he was a, you know, a usurper of sorts. Um, it, it could be. I actually, I actually read that recently, and I'll have an answer for you. But I read that, and I, I at this time, I can't recall why he was called that. Okay. Um, as far as the king of Persia, uh, let me share this with you. Um, so I was detained there with the kings of Persia. This is what we read early in chapter 10. This is what this comment says. In the Hebrew, this sentence is not clear in the original text. What is clear is that Michael came to help the angel Gabriel, who had been detained, detained by his conflict with the prince of the Persian kingdom. Now, the prince of the Persian kingdom, listen to this. Um, it comes from the noun sar, S-A-R. Um, and it says that it's used here, it, the way it's used in that verse, this is back, going back to chapter 10, verse 13, remember? He couldn't come because of the, king of per, the prince of Persia. He couldn't come. He detained, with, uh, he detained me for three weeks. Which means if an angel, if a celestial being, being cannot come detained by this prince, that prince is mighty. Now, you know, we could read that in a couple of different ways. One, this is a supernatural prince may be represented by Satan or a demon, very, very powerful, or the celestial being wanted to do something, but because of circumstances and the way men and women do sometimes, they can thwart God's plans, you know, doing what, I mean, if you want to go out and preach, well, I'm just going to go and chain all of these doors. Let's see you get out of this church now, you know, you know, I mean, it could mean that, but let me finish reading this. Um, scholars have debated the identity of this prince. Most think that a supernatural being similar in rank to Gabriel is in view and that he was the patron angel of the Persian kingdom, an evil angel, or perhaps Satan himself, this prince of Persia. That's how I've seen it personally. It, perhaps it was Satan. Since in Daniel's book there is a synergism between events in heaven and on earth, it is possible that a person on earth someone like the crown prince of Persia, opposed God's plan at the instigation of his spiritual counterpart. The crown prince Cambyses, whose father King Cyrus made co-regent, was a devout Zoroastrian. Zoroastrianism um, began in Persia. You ever heard of Zoroastrianism, that religion? Yeah, it actually began in Persia. Um, and we won't go over the, some of that. Um, but um, anyways, just some comments as far as the prince of Persia. Um, it's, it, there's some mysterious aspects here in chapter 11, but again, with these new lessons, again, I'm learning myself. I am going to educate myself more and more and more. And, um, so we'll have to do another seminar with the new lessons. No, not shortly. That's going to take a while. I was telling my wife, um, I'm just reviewing a lot of materials and, doing uh, just re just a whole new set. I know, so when I'm done, I, I have to show this stuff to scholars, you know, and get their feedback and their input and suggestions. Uh, you got to tweak this or you should have mentioned this because this is vital in this chapter or in, these, in the book or whatever. So I have to have the, the, uh, the ones that are more experienced than I have to have them look at, at this stuff. Um, number eight, who is the mighty king that shall stand up? And I think we already read that verse. A mighty king. <laughs> okay. Who is it? He's a mighty king. A mighty king shall stand up. Okay. 
Um, yes, this could possibly be Alexander the Great, because remember, we're talking about kings of Persia against Greece, and a mighty king shall stand up. This is what the beginning of the chapter said, so we know we're talking about the Persians and the Greeks. Number nine asks, what will happen to the kingdom after the death of Alexander, according to verse four? Verse four says, and when he has arisen, the kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides thee. We read something very similar in Daniel chapter 8. When the horn is broken off, four horns, the kingdom will be divided. We know that it was divided among his generals and it did not have, Greece did not have the same potency as it did under Alexander the Great. Um, I, I suppose because Alexander the Great was just indispensable um, as far as leadership of Greece was concerned. Right. It shall be divided, the answer, toward the four winds of the heaven, north, south, east, and west. Okay? Now, we must keep in mind that Daniel 11 and 1 through 4 are literal because he is, the angel is talking about kings of Persia, kings of Greece, etc. In the rest of the verses, there's a lot of symbolism in the chapter. And that's what the Bible actually does. You'll even see this in Revelation, um, where there's a mixture. So don't think, well, you know, how can that be a mixture? You'll see mixtures of symbolism and literalism even in one verse. I'll give you an example. In Revelation chapter, um, chapter 7, the Bible says, the verse, first verse, it says, uh, first, second, two, first two verses, the Bible says, the angels are holding the four winds back. Now, are angels symbolic or literal? literal. Well, how about winds, holding the four winds back from destroying the earth? Are the winds literal or symbolic? symbolic. I would say symbolic the winds of destruction, of calamity, of chaos. And so they're holding that back. Well, I would say literal angels are, are, are preventing these things from happening until God's people are sealed. Now, God's people, is that literal or symbolic? Literal, to his people. How about the sealing of the people, the 144,000? I would say it's symbolic. And so, so um, there, there is this mixture in apocalyptic prophecies. Okay, some of it will be literal, some of it will be symbolic. What symbol is now used to describe the two powers uh, in the Grecian realm that fight against each other? What symbol is now used? The king of the south and the king of the north. You see that on the map, on the screen. King of the south and of the north. Number 11, we're going to speed up here because uh, it's already close to 8 o'clock. Number 11, Daniel 11 verses 16 through 30 gives intricate details of the pagan Roman Empire. What are a few of the description that Daniel gives this power? Um, these are more of political activities of a contemptible person. Let's look at this. Letter A. Then shall stand up in his state a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. That was in verse 20, Daniel 11, verse 20. That may be a reference to Caesar Augustus, who became a great taxer of the people. Okay? And then letter B says, and sh this is verse 22, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. The prince of the covenant. Who is the prince of the covenant? It's Jesus Christ. And when did Jesus live? During which empire did Jesus live? During the Roman Empire. Okay? So it was the pagan Roman Empire that broke Christ by crucifying him on the cross. Again, these are more like political activities. Letter C, his heart shall be against the holy covenant. Now, pagan Rome sought to destroy the covenant of God and the covenant people of God through persecution, distortion of its doctrine. Who was it that blamed the Christians for burning Rome? Supposedly. There's, we all say Nero, um, but supposedly it was, yeah, it was Nero. 
um, that blamed the Christians for burning Rome. And of course, uh, you know, um, he persecuted the Christians, not at first, but later persecuted the Christians. And um, the other one starts with a letter D. I can't remember. I'm drawing a blank. Also persecuted uh, Christians. So this is more political Rome that is happening here. But look at question 12. The next several descriptions in verses 31 through 39 portray the activities of religious Rome, papacy. You will notice that many of the same descriptions found in Daniel 7 and 8 reappear in this chapter, in chapter 11, which help us to identify this. Okay, so letter A says, he shall take away the daily sacrifice, the daily. We talked about the daily, the tamid. Um, what is the daily, remember? Everything. It's everything. All of the services from the courtyard to the holy place. Not the most holy place, because that was only entered once a year. But the courts, the sacrifices, the washing, the holy place, the, the making sure the candelabra is lit, the, the incense. Once a week, you replace the bread on the table of bread. That was done uh, always. The priests that were rotating, it was their turn that day. They were always doing that. That was the daily. That was the ha daily, tamid. That was the daily. Okay, so it's not just the sacrifices. It's everything. It's the whole heavenly service, which was a service of mediation for God's people when the sanctuary was standing. It was a mediatorial ministry. That's what the daily was. Okay? And then letter... I'm sorry? This is what the little horn power in Daniel 7 uh, does. And in Daniel 8, takes away this daily, takes away this mediatorial ministry that is symbolized in the sanctuary where Christ is our mediator. We pray to Christ. He is the only mediator between God and man. It is his righteousness, it is his forgiveness that we receive. The church in the Middle Ages took that away completely. Now you have other mediators, saints. You have the Virgin Mary as the mediator. And you have the priests taking the place of God. Anything that the priests do and declare and decree, God has to abide by what they say. This is written in their own literature. And so that mediation of looking to Christ as mediator and gaining access straight to the throne of God himself through the person and ministry and life and death and sacrifice and priestly ministry in heaven, everything was through Christ. All of that was taken away. It was taken away. Now, you can't take away heaven and bring it down literally, obviously. But in the sense of its effectiveness and its... Um, Ability, ability to operate on planet Earth, it was taken away. And it was usurped by fallen man. By fallen man. Letter C. The king shall do according to his will. Oops. I'm sorry. Where, where am I? Okay. There it is. Letter B. I skipped one. They shall, they shall place the abomination that make desolate. That's in verse 31. Okay. Uh, destroying the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. We talked about that, the abomination that makes desolate. Um, letter C. Now this is talking about the religious activities of the contemptible person again. Letter C. The king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. Above every God. Shame. This power. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let's go to letter D. I have some comments, but I have to, it's already after eight, I'm sorry. Letter D, neither shall he regard the desire of women. Um, you know, that's sort of a um, hard one. Neither shall he regard the desire of women. That could mean... Um, that could be in the marital relationship is done away with. Um, we all know that the priesthood is not into marriage. It doesn't mean the desire for women is not there. <laughs> um, 
But uh, I, I'm not going to really overemphasize on that one. Letter E, he shall divide the land for gain. He shall divide the land for gain. The land for gain. The lesson says here, this may be a reference to the papal attempt to be the one who decides who gets what land, such as the Roman pontiffs did in dividing up the lands of the New World among the kings of Spain, Portugal, France, and England. Daniel 11 has traced for us once again the rise and fall of the various empires of antiquity. In startling detail, Daniel has indicated what is going to happen in Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and religious Rome, papacy. Only the divine foreknowledge of God could have given us such a detailed history written in advance. Remember, in the latter days is what uh, was told Daniel. But let us not miss the point behind it all. The real lesson we need to learn from this prophecy is that God is in control of world events. He knows it's going to happen. Unfortunately, evil is not done away with completely in our lifetimes. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, questions that I'm sure we'll all ask God is, you know, although evil is not done away with, sometimes God turns it around but sometimes God tolerates it, um, tolerates it, um, and evil has its way. Even though God is, is in control, I don't want to say managing, but I would say in control. I'd say control is a stronger word than just managing, but uh, we'll get all of our answers. But ultimately, God is in control, and he's going to accomplish his will. Okay, number 13, what happens at the time of the end? At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. So at this point in the prophecy, this is the end part of the prophecy. Since the events described in verses 40 through 45 are still future, um, uh, our author says that we shouldn't be too dogmatic as far as how all of that is going to be fulfilled. However, we can carefully examine what Daniel says these powers will do in the last days. So let's look at what they will do in the last days. What does the king of the north do in the last days according to Daniel 11 verse 40? I'm just going to read it uh, from the Bible. And it says here, 11 verse 40, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through them, or pass over. So this uh, king of the north is going to come like a whirlwind, with fury, uh, with power, okay? So not only the king of the south, but this guy, the one of the north, uh, they're both involved in this uh, mighty conflict, this mighty conflict, okay? But what land does the king of the north enter, according to verse, verse 41? He enters the glorious land, mm -hmm. which is Palestine. Mm -hmm. That's the glorious land. Glorious land is also mentioned in, um, in Daniel, oh, what was it, eight or nine. I, can't, I don't remember, but uh, it's, he enters into the glorious land, which is Palestine, which is obviously Palestine. Okay. Number 16 says, how widespread will be his domain in the time of the end? Let's read it, verses 42 through 43. How widespread? He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of what? Egypt shall not escape. So Egypt is involved here. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So that's verses 42 and 43. So the answer is over Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians. So this is widespread, uh, widespread power. Number 17 in spite of the fact that this king, this northern king, has conquered all of this territory, what now troubles him? What now troubles him? Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. 
So he's coming from the north, he's conquering all this land towards the glorious land, Palestine, and even south of Palestine, Egypt and Libya and all of these areas. Now he gets this news from where he came from, from the north, and also from the east are going to trouble him. Okay? So he's not, now he's not very happy. When he is thus troubled, what does he do? What does this king do? He shall go forth, the Bible says in verse 44, with great fury to destroy and utterly to make, take, uh, make away many. Make away many? Take away many. <laughs> he shall go forth with great fury to destroy. Here again is depicted this uh, big, huge final conflict, um, which anybody opposes me, king of the north, you're going to be in trouble because I'm going to come against you. Okay, that's what's going on. Where does this power seek to plant its tabernacle? Where does this power seek to plant its tabernacle? In the glorious holy mountain is what 40, verse 45. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall what? Come to his end and no one will help him. This king will prosper a lot, is powerful, gains victories, destroys, goes into the glorious land, Palestine, where God's people are. But in the end, he's going to come to an end and nobody's going to help this king of the north in the least. This is, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to tag. Let's look at our note here. It says, thank God this power will come to an end. This final great controversy will cease. This is just general notes. This power may seek to destroy God's last day people, but the promise is that he will come to his end and no one shall help him. Many of the details of this final conflict are not totally clear from Daniel 11, but one thing is clear. There will be a final great conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and ultimately Christ and his people will win this conflict. Um, okay, so um, I'm not, I don't want to get in trouble here. What comes to my mind is uh, Revelation chapter 18. Uh, because the political, the geopolitical religious power of Revelation chapter 18 is... Uh, powerful, rich merchants trading with the countries, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is none other than Babylon. Spiritual Babylon is what Revelation 18 is talking about. This religious, uh, political, uh, global power will come to an end and nobody will come to help a spiritual Babylon. Nobody. Um, everybody is amazed at how part, read it for yourself, Revelation 18. Everybody is amazed how, um, uh, how fallen this power actually came to be. And um, people are just from afar, looking from afar. Wow. Who the beast are to say it? Um, this, okay, so spiritual Babylon in the last, this, so this is the last days. Revelation, Revelation 18 is the last days. Spiritual Babylon is this fraudulent religious power that has political and geographical push and sway and influence um, and, and, and the planet, in the planet. Very rich. This isn't just any old power. This power is very rich, loaded with money. Doesn't that point to the Vatican? That's what, I, that's what we believe, that this points to the papal power, the right. Vatican, um, that is very, extremely influential in the world and will increase in influence. Um, you know, I was just reading a book about the very strong anti-Catholicism in our country. Yes, in the United States of America, uh, you know, back in the 1800s. Um, some books, uh, this one author, refutes the accuracy of these books, whether these things really happen in certain convents, etc. Uh, but there was a lot, there was strong anti-Catholic uh, sentiment. Um, and um, 
there's, there's, uh, it was just very strong. This is a Protestant country. People came from Catholic Europe to establish religious liberty. So we don't want a church, we don't want a state church. That's basically how this country, one of the principles that this country was founded upon, as well as civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, that type of thing, freedom of the press. Um, and, um, uh, but it was Ronald Reagan who was the first, oh, and when John F. Kennedy was elected as president, there was some protests. There was some protests. Yes, you know, the first Irish Catholic president, and there was some strong protests. There was still a lot of anti, now it's, that doesn't even exist nowadays, this anti-Catholic sentiment in our country. It's, it's taboo. You know, it's, bigot, it's, it's bigotry. It's the other way, you know. We, and, uh, and it was Reagan that appointed the first ambassador to the Vatican. Hardly anybody raised any outcry because of that. You know, and ever since then we've had, I think, I believe ever since then we've had uh, ambassadors uh, to the Vatican. Yes. And uh, in fact, I remember reading years and years ago while Reagan was still president, um, how um, some of the United States uh, policies um, I don't think they were international policies. I think they were domestic, how they were changed under Reagan's leadership because of Vatican influence and, uh, you know, in, in Vatican say. And so this is not to say that um, the current Pope, Pope um, Francis. Francis, I was going to say Benedictine, that's not the one. Pope Francis, I'm sorry. That's not to say that, um, you know, he is an evil man and, you know, I mean, if you go around talking like that, uh, you are just destroying yourself. However, the, uh, the, the worldwide influence is so powerful that if a very genteel individual as the Pope is, he's very genteel and very soft-spoken and humble. I mean, he goes around meeting people and shaking their hands, you know, although he scolded a Chinese and Asian lady <laughs> for pulling his hand back. I thought that <laughs> he later apologized though. But I mean, he didn't even put all of his garb on when he was elected the Pope. I mean, the first, to, you know, just a humble garb and uh, so he seems to be a very genteel man, which makes the influence and the power even that much more attractive. Likeable. Uh, likeable, of course. He, he seems to be a likable guy. But, um, but, you know, we don't live our lives in the realm of following God with all of our hearts and of giving God uh, ultimate allegiance. Um, we don't let the likable get in the way of that. And uh, if somebody is wrong, I don't care how likable a person is. If it's in my own church or the Catholic church or in another church, I don't care how likable you are. You, you, we're not rude to people. But when it comes to the teachings of Scripture and following the teachings of Scripture, even at the cost of our very life, this is what we've been looking at in the examples of Daniel and the three guys then likable as an individual is and, and uh, far-reaching the influence, and I don't care what the majority says, if the Bible says this, we go by Scripture. And it's not the Pope, it's the institution. Yeah, and so we're not, you know, you don't, you don't go around thinking in your mind and then in, in wording attack individuals who are of other religions. Uh, we just don't do that. Um, we may, when the time is appropriate to speak up, we may tell truth as Jesus did, but Jesus didn't go around insulting people. He told the truth and they took it as insult, but Jesus didn't have an insulting attitude and mindset towards, towards people. We, we shouldn't either. And we need to remember if, if anybody who claims to have the truth, well, be careful because then you're more accountable before God. And people who have more knowledge of Scripture, whoever that person is, more knowledge of Scripture, then they're more accountable before God.
Wouldn't you think? Yep. Um, anyways, what happens to this power when it seeks to conquer the glorious holy mountain? He shall come to his end and none shall help him. What happens to God's people in this final time of trouble? I love this verse, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up and there shall be a time of trouble. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Now that's good news. At that time, thy people shall be delivered. Do you wish to be delivered? And Michael stands up. Amen? Amen? Okay, here's some interesting similarities between Daniel 11 and the previous chapters. Daniel 11, 21 and 22 is Rome under Tiberius. Points back to Daniel 9, 25 through 27. In both references, it speaks of Christ as the Messiah, the Prince. In Daniel 9, it's the Messiah, the Prince, that shall, cease, that shall cause the sacrifices to cease and he's cut off in the middle of the week. Daniel 11.31 points back and supports Daniel 8.11. You should just take a picture of this because I'm going about this quick. Right yeah. <laughs> Daniel 11.31 through 39 points back and repeats the same description of the papacy in Daniel 7, 20 through 25, the little horn activities of Daniel chapter 7. And this is next, the next lesson, Daniel's people delivered. Now, the next lesson is when? Friday. This Friday. This Friday. This is, no, um, then we're going Saturday. So Saturday morning and Saturday at 2 p.m. The 2 p.m. one is the last one. And there's no potluck. There's no potluck? Yeah, there's no, so bring your own lunch. You want it, or just go home and eat and come back. Okay. So I have tonight's uh, lesson here. Daniel's people delivered. I'm going to ask my lovely assistant. No, that's not you, Carlos. No, that's not you, Bob. This is... <laughs> don't flatter yourself, Bob. <laughs> okay, that lovely assistant. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll see you Friday night. Okay, any questions? I just want to make a comment. Yes. Remember when you were doing the timeline thing? Right. And something was sticking in my head about the third year of Tiberius' reign. And you were talking about when the sanctuary, when the, when the timeline would start. And I was thinking in my head, it was the third year of Tiberius. No, it was the third year of Tiberius when Jesus was baptized. This is what the Bible said. Oh, okay. That's where I got confused. Yeah, so uh, I'm trying to get your question. So on that timeline, it began in 457 B.C., and the 70 weeks, uh, the 69th week ended in 27 AD. That's when Christ was baptized. The third or 15th year of Tiberius. That's what was sticking in my head. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. I just went back and, and oh, checked. Oh, see, you're doing, your, you're doing your homework. You're, that's good. See, did you hear her? <laughs> she's, she's studying her history. <laughs> that's great. Okay. All right. Why don't we all stand? And no refreshments tonight. Sorry. We'll see if we can have some Friday night. I'll, I'll check on that. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our lesson. And Lord, there's, I know there's lots of questions, but we do know, Lord, uh, our takeaway, I think, is that you are in control of these matters because you predicted them. They will happen as was foretold. And uh, we trust Jesus that um, in those times of trouble, that you will stand and deliver us and rescue us, Lord. Help us to have faith in you. We thank you for this information, Lord. And um, may we always find rest and peace, knowing that you are in control of the destinies, not only of people, of us, but of entire nations. So we thank you for being sovereign of the universe. Please take care of us as we travel back to our homes. Give us a good night's rest, and we pray that you will bring us back this coming Friday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, have a good night, everybody. God bless you. Yeah. See you Friday at 7 o'clock.